Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to turn your bolts in one more time. We're going to do a quick word of prayer here as we begin our service. And let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much uh, that we have the privilege of knowing you, being able to read your words that have been given to us throughout all of history. Lord, we thank you that you have cared so well for us, that you have supplied all of our needs. And Lord, as we continue to talk about them in the sermon hour, Lord, we just pray that you'd bless us with a new understanding of just how compassionate and how loving and how dedicated of a father you are to us. Lord, as we think about the needs of the world around us, we come with heavy hearts in the sense that there is some really hard things that people are going through, some very difficult things. And Lord, we, we trust in you for your sovereignty and for your grace. Lord, we trust in you for your mercy and for your loving kindness and compassion. Lord, but help each one of them to be in a special relationship with you as they go through their hard trial. Lord, help them to recommit, help them to reconnect, help them to grow in an understanding of you through the time. Lord, for them who have these unspoken requests before you, Lord, we just pray that you would speak to them in a real powerful way. Lord, we just pray that they would feel your presence in, a, in an exciting new way, that they may learn to have more and more faith in you as the time progresses. Lord, we just pray for the ongoing needs of the Wade family. Lord, we know that uh, grief can hit hard sometimes, not every day sometimes, but on the occasion, on the day, grief comes in and it is a very emotional thing. Lord, we just pray that you would comfort them and that you would find us faithful to comfort those who are at any point of their grieving cycle, Lord. Help us to be patient and kind. Help us to be understanding that even in grief comes anger and grief comes guilt or grief comes some real just tough emotions, Lord. We just pray that you would make us as compassionate as you are as they go through their griefing cycle. Lord, we just pray specifically for the Wade family that you just be with them. We think going forward of even the Porter family, uh, Jen and Todd's uh, dad, Todd's dad, Carl Porter, as he continues to fight for his life, Lord, we just pray a special blessing on that family, that they would feel your presence and feel this time of connection with you. Lord, we just pray for a miraculous healing in Carl's life, if it be your will. But Lord, we leave him in your hands, and, and Lord, we just pray that you would comfort the family surrounding them. Lord, we pray for the ongoing of, needs of Kimbra and Adam McLaughlin as, as uh, it's been a year now, a year this week that they lost little Emma. Lord, we just pray that you'd be with, her, be with them and that you'd, again, just overwhelm them with your peace, knowing that they will see her again uh, if they put their faith and trust in you. Lord, we pray for Peggy in that way and, and for the rest of the uh, family. Lord, we pray for Alva as he continues to make some tough choices about his surgery and about what to do with his arm. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, give him wisdom. Lord, we just pray for him and his brother that you'd heal them. And, and Lord, we just pray that again, that you would, they would find a connection with you that just runs deeper than it's ever run before. Lord, we pray for Sydney. We pray for Jeremy who is struggling probably even in this hour. Lord, we just pray for his back and that you would Give him the kind of wisdom and resolve he needs to find out the best solution for him. Lord, I thank you for the traveling mercies you bestowed on my mom. Thank you that she was able to leave her home and go down to North Carolina and spend some time with family. Lord, we just thank you that it's been years that she has not been able to do that. It's been years that she has been shut in, but now she's been able to make a trip. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for that. We pray for continued healing uh, for her spine and for her cancer in that way. Lord, did you just... Um, work a mighty miracle in her life, as you've already done. Lastly, Lord, we just pray for uh, both Honey and for her medical issues and for Israel. Lord, we just pray for Israel in a real special way. Lord, we just thank you that uh, we can read about their history and that we can grow uh, from their life story. Lord, we pray that you just bless them in a real special way. Lord, we just pray that more and more uh, of the special people will come to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah that they would live in a messianic kingdom even now with Jesus being their Messiah. Lord, we just pray that they would put their faith in him and put their trust in him for all of their future events. Lord, we just pray that this would happen sooner rather than later, that they wouldn't wait until you have your second coming, that they wouldn't wait until the tribulation happens, Lord, but that they would claim you now 
and, and spare themselves even that tribulation that is to come. I pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you have your sermon notebook and want to open it up, um, I'll give you a few slides here. Again, I don't have very many to offer you, but I do have a couple. Uh, most of these are just by way of helping you remember where we've come from or where we're going to. And uh, forgive me here as I struggle to get it on the screen. Yep, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, if you want to go there with me. Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> All right. Technology is great when it works, right? Okay, there we go. That's good enough. All right. We have been talking, as you know, about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, again, as I've said every week, I don't want to review too much, but this is the best place that you can be in Scripture, Matthew chapter 5. I mean, if you're new uh, to uh, faith and new to your relationship with the Lord, I would have strongly encourage you to spend time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, it's really important that you know who Jesus was and what his work was and who he was and how he lived his life, what he was passionate about, what he was compassionate about, how he took pity on people, how he healed people, how he proved himself to be the Son of God, how he died, how he rose from the earth uh, into new life, and how he promises to us to give us that new immortal life with him someday if we put our faith and trust in him. You really could do, do no better than spending a lot of time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, of course, being a really great gospel in the sense that it does, in a very real and specific and powerful way, show you how Jesus Christ was the Son of God and the Messiah for us to put our faith in him. But here we are in Matthew chapter 5. We're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. This is a time where Christ came uh, to the earth and spoke to uh, his disciples on a mountain and on that mountain, he gave them this precious sermon, the sermon that we call the Sermon on the Mount. We've been talking about the Beatitudes. In other words, these are the attitudes that every believer should have uh, in their life. And we're going to go through those again this morning. Um, but lovingly, we call this section of Scripture, uh, at least these first 12 verses, the Beatitudes. And these are the attitudes that, as a believer, we should embrace. These are the things that we should be. So like I've done in every sermon so far, uh, I've given you Matthew chapter 5, 1 through 12. I want to read that to you. And then I'm going to read verses 25 through 34 of Matthew chapter 6 as we get started here. So Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened up his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And today we get into again verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God or children of God. Verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's important. Having a relationship with God uh, in opposition to the world's philosophy will cause persecution. You've got to keep that in context. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25 we're talking about here the cure for anxiety. I mean, this is the heading that I have in my scripture. Maybe you have one in yours as well. We're going to talk a little bit about those anxieties today. Verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, 
nor for the body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor do they reap and, into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how um, the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say unto you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you little, little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, or for the people who are not yet part of the kingdom of God, right now Christ is focusing on the people of Israel, focusing on his children living in Israel. The Gentiles would representatively say are unsaved people. For the unsaved people eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you are in need of all these things. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray one more time. Father God, what we do not know, we pray that you teach us. And Lord, what we do not have, we pray that you'd give us. And Lord, what we are not, we pray that you'd make us. In the likeness of your Son, we pray for all these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. So, uh, by way of uh, uh, brief dis description again, I'm going to put these things on the slide, and then we're going to talk about them uh, at the end of the sermon. So, I am going to move them uh, by pretty quickly. But these are the main verses that we have been talking about. Blessed are the poor in spirit, talking about our mind. Blessed are they that mourn, talking about our emotions. Blessed are the meek, we're talking about actions. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, we're talking about our love. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Here we just stopped and talked about our individual story, the essence of who we are. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We're talking about examining our life. And again, we're going to talk about these again at the end of the sermon, hopefully. In verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. That is the point of the message again this morning. Talking about specifically the end of that phrase, children of God. That's the idea that I want you to hold on to. Are you a child of God? Of God. Now, I've made this acronym for a reason. Uh, M E A L I E R spells mealier. And what I'm really trying to get you to understand is this idea of being a mealy Christian or a mealy person for that matter. Uh, but a mealy in the figurative sense, I'll give you that definition, is what I want you to hold on to. Mealy can be used to describe someone's speech or writing as lacking substance or death, depth. It suggests that their words may be insipid or bland or lacking in meaningful content, okay? So, for example, when you speak to somebody and you're talking about, like, the core issues of life, when you're talking about how to handle the core issues of life, when you're talking about your misery or your pain or whatever the case may be, sometimes you can talk to somebody and they're just like, well, here, here's a bottle of Milwaukee's Best, have another drink because I don't have any answers for you. That's a pretty insipid, pretty bland, pretty unthoughtful response. Bury yourself in the bottle of a bottle. It ain't good enough, okay? And we need to offer ourselves and the rest of the world a little bit more than that. We shouldn't have a mealy response for what's going on in this life. Hopefully you're so connected with the God of the universe that people would look at you and say, you are a child of God. You do have what I need. I can see that you have something that I am missing. Give me what you found. You found bread, give me that bread. That's what I'm after, okay? And so we just want to make sure that as a believer, we don't have mealy responses in this life where we fail to address the core issues, but rather if someone asks us a direct question, we offer them the truth. We offer them real meaningful responses to how we should live our life. And so the reminder that I gave you last week and the reminder that I give you this week again is are you a mealy Christ follower? Just generically speaking, pretty mealy, because what we see in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, that's like, that's like the number one thing that's got to happen, and from each verse that's in progression, you get into a deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper understanding. Each beatitude stands on the shoulders of the other beatitude, okay? 
We need to understand what verse 3 says in order to understand what verse 4 says. We need to understand what verse 4 says in order to understand what verse 5 says and so on and so forth. And so as a true disciple, a disciple who should be or is called to be the salt of the earth and able to bring about the full flavor of life that God meant us to have, are you actually doing that? Are you actually bringing that to the table? You know, likewise, a true disciple should be able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, withstand the heat of persecution to some degree in this world. Do, do, you, do you pass those kinds of tests that show that you truly are a child of God? Whereas, as we've learned even in this sermon, in multiple places, even in chapter 5 and and beginning in verse in chapter six, the 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 reality is is that we are prone to be mealy Christians. We are prone to be hypocritical. We are prone to look good on the outside like a red delicious apple. Remember, that's a terrible apple. You don't ever eat red delicious apples. They're nasty. Okay, but are you just a Christian on the outside, whereas your heart is still full of unaddressed sin, right? And and we need to be honest about that. And it starts in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Be honest about what is really going on in our heart. And as we'll talk today, as we move through this progressive, progressive list, we will be uh, able to have and be able to provide more and more peace, not only to ourselves, but to other people. And again, hopefully you can look at a pastor, or you can look at the elders or Perhaps you can look up to one of your relatives who you believe walks pretty close to the Lord, who obviously seems to dwell with the Lord. And you might say, again, well, I know I don't, I don't, I know I don't stack up to him. I don't stack up to the Apostle Paul, for example. I don't think any of us would say, I'm greater than the Apostle Paul. But we look at the Apostle Paul and we're like, wow, I wish I was like him in, in so many ways. And if that's the condition of your life right now where you're just saying, well, look, I know I've got room to grow. Praise God for that. Praise God that right now you can admit that you're a mealy Christian, but you can't stay there. Okay, God wants you to grow. God wants you to move on. God wants you to move forward into a deeper and deeper relationship with him. And, and hopefully, uh, whether it's the pastor or the other elders or people in the church, hopefully they'll inspire your faith to be more and more uh, like Christ and and embrace this idea of being a child of God. Or you can go just straight to the Bible, as we talked about last week, and look at all the good examples of men and women, and even some bad examples of men and women, who have had the chance or uh, had the ability or had the privilege of experiencing God, and just look at their lives and just say, how did their lives change? What things strengthened their faith? What things uh, did they struggle with? How did they finish the race? And then thinking about, even fruit, as we read in the sermon here, what is the fruit of their lives? What things changed? What grew out of their life? What low-hanging fruit can I even put in my life, you know, to offer uh, other people? Again, we're going to be focused on Matthew chapter 5, 9. And again, I want to call your attention to the word, the sons of God or the children of God, because the question, again, that I'm trying to drive you toward is, are you a son or are you a daughter? Are you a child of the high God? And you might say, I hope so. And I really do hope so. Well, I want to ask you then a very simple question again about being a child. Where do you reside or where do you dwell? Because that's the R that I gave you uh, in that acronym was talking about the idea of residence. Where do you live? Is it your joy to live in the presence of the, of the God of the universe? Or is it your inclination to live as far away from God as possible, you know. Uh, really, where you choose to reside, where you choose to dwell, says a lot about your relationship uh, with our God. Let me give you some scriptures to help us understand this. Go to Psalms. We know that the psalmist is really good for our soul. Uh, he is writing uh, in so many ways out of the emotions and out of his heart here, even though... Uh, 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 this psalm, I don't, it's not in my scripture said whether or not it's written by David or whether it's written by Asaph or somebody else. This one is one of those psalms that just touches you and just helps you understand what it's like 
to long for true connection and true worship with the God that we serve. So let me just read this Psalms to you. Psalms chapter 84. It says, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house. This is Psalms 84. And the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house, exclamation point. They are ever praising you. Hopefully that is true not only for our lives now, but obviously we'll be doing that in the future. Verse 5, how blessed is the man whose strength is in you. When is this? Now in the present moment or 100 years from now when we're, when we're already passed away? No, this is, this is talking about how blessed we are if our strength is in you now, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The earthly rain, it covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God to Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. And you look upon the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. Amen? Amen. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Amen? Amen. I mean, that is, that is what our heart says. You don't want to be in that tent anymore. We, we've all been there. We've all dwelt in the, in the tent of wickedness. Even if we could just stand on the doorway, on the threshold of God, we know it's so much better than anything we've ever experienced living, for our li- living our lives for ourselves in the tent of wickedness. Verse 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield, and the Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Is this now, or is this only in the future? It's now. It's always. All right? This is how we live life. This is our connection to the Lord. Verse 12, O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. And that's important. We got to trust in him. It's about faith, okay? Without faith, it is impossible to please God, okay? You can stack up all your good deeds right in a row. Give to the poor, open up an orphanage. That means very little, almost nothing to the God of the universe if you're not doing it out of a pure heart with a motivation to do it for God's glory And you have the faith in him that if you just put forth the zealous works, he will bless it as he sees to bless it. If you're just doing it just to carve a pathway to God, you're missing the boat. It's all about faith, okay? Believing in the Lord uh, and and trusting in him to bless your life and to bless the works of your hands under the influence of the Holy Spirit, as we learned in Sunday school this morning. Psalms chapter 91, I'd like for you to turn there as well. We hear again, we, we... well, again, I'm, I'm trying to build into your mind the concept of being a child of God. And I need you to just think about it in simple, simple, simple ways. Okay? If you are a child of God, you dwell somewhere with someone. You reside with them in some way. As a small child is reliant upon their parent, so should you be with our Creator. Psalms chapter 91, verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Okay, think about it. When the bombardment of life happens, just explosion after explosion after explosion in your life, where do you go to reside? Do you reside with the king in the bomb shelter he's created for your soul? Or do you run out in the street and just be like, like, We need to understand where we choose to reside is a big deal, okay? Here in Scripture, we're saying, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is he who delivers me from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me with his pinions and under his wings I may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, because you're in his bomb shelter. 
of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or of destruction that lays in waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look at, on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you. And here we come with kind of this idea of guardian angels. Do they exist? And I think there is a place for it, okay, where angels really do kind of watch and are inspired to take care of certain things for the Lord at appointed times. Who knows? But praise God that they're there helping and that he has put even his angels in charge concerning us to guard us in all our ways. Verse 12, they will bear you up in hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra. The young lion and the serpent will trample down because he has loved me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with a long life. I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Of course, this is the conversation here that we have from God to you. Because, in verse 14, he has loved me. Because Wayne Rowland has loved me. Because Heather Porter has loved me. Because they have loved me, therefore I will deliver them. I will set them securely on high because they know my name. How important it is for us to know who the name of our God is. Do you know him by name? Okay. And, and when I call upon him, God will answer. And he will be with me in trouble. And he will rescue me as I try to honor him. With a long life, he will satisfy me. And he'll let me see the salvation which is to come. Praise God for all of that. And so we get into the New Testament then. And here Christ is, is like, preaching the same thing to you over and over and over again in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Christ says it differently, but the same way from the Old Testament, okay? John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, okay? Make your residence with me. Put yourself in my bomb shelter. You be with me, and I will be with you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who stays connected to me, he who lives with me, he who abides in me, and I in him, he is the one that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? And if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown out away as a branch and dries up, and they gather him the cast him in the fire, and they are burned. The reason why they're cut off and dragged away is because they don't abide with the Lord. They're just fuel for the fire. But, in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask something noble. Is that what it says? It says, ask whatever you wish. These are the words of your God. Ask whatever you wish. I'll ask him for a Lamborghini today. I, I don't need a Lamborghini. And if your kids asked for a Lamborghini from you, you'd probably be like, George, you don't need a Lamborghini. You can't even drive yet, buddy. You know. But who knows? What, what keeps us from connecting with the God of the universe in such a very humble, very simple way? You have needs? Ask of them. It's his joy to answer your prayers. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Again, as a good father would take care of his children, he will give you everything that you need and everything that would be good for you in this life. And of course, we see the balance. If we were to go back to uh, Matthew chapter 6, and here I'm just spitballing here a little bit, but... Um, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Christ writes, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and be opened to you. Chapter 7, verse 8. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and him who knocks will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? 
When he asks for a fish, you want to give him a snake? Will he, if then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children? How much more with your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Okay? So your good father knows how to give good gifts. Okay? You may think the best thing for your life is a whole bag of marijuana. Oh, yeah. No. Bad. <laughs> Sorry, I brought that one up. So anyway, your God knows what's the better things for you than that, okay? There are more important things. I just used that example one time because I was ministering to a youth in jail, and the, I asked the guy if he had a relationship with the Lord, and he goes, oh, yeah, I do. One time I was really bored, and I said, Lord, I just need something to take away my boredom. And I, walked, well, I stepped out beside my tent, and there was a bag of marijuana sitting on, my ground, on the ground, and I said, Lord, thank you for that bag of marijuana. I'm not bored anymore. And I'm like, I don't think that that bag of marijuana came to you from the Lord. I really don't, okay? And, and honey, you're just going to have to believe me on this one. I don't want to call you out, but there's a time and a place for certain things. There's a time and a place to ask for appropriate things. Whether or not marijuana is medicinal or isn't it, that's not the point. The point is your good father knows how to give good gifts and things that you really need. Smoking marijuana to solve a boredom is not what you need. It's not a good gift. Maybe if they found a Bible out on their front door... Honey, I need you to stop. Sorry. Thank you. All right. My question to you then is, are you a child of God? Okay. Are you someone's child? And if so, where do you reside and where do you dwell? You know, I know that we live in a fallen and broken world where families have split for a number of reasons. Again, as I said last week, it's never God's attention that you live in a broken home or that our kids live in a broken home or someone else's kids live in a broken home. That's not the intent of God. Sometimes those bad things happen. And we struggle through those things and, and struggle to stay connected with uh, our loved ones in that way. But if we would stay connected, both, both sets of parents, with the God of the universe, making him the center of our life in everything, our homes would be secure and everything would be okay. But whether you're young or old, whether you're single or married, whether you're widow or orphan or abandoned, you just need to think about the idea of that there is some physical needs some emotional needs and some spiritual needs that you absolutely need because you're a human and will absolutely help you. And, 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 uh, and these are the things that are just part of being human that we need in this life. So your Father in Heaven understands your condition, your physical condition and what you need. He understands uh, uh, what a roof over your head means to you. He understands your emotional needs and how he needs to shelter you from the storm of your life. He understands those spiritual needs, and so he is connecting you with himself in a real positive way, and it's in the sense that the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart and dwell with you and teach you the word of God. But again, as I've said it once, I'll keep saying it, where do you reside? All right? Do you reside with the God of the universe, or do you resent in the tent of wickedness? That is a choice that only you can decide. I want to go uh, to Genesis chapter 2 with with you if you want to flip there, Genesis chapter 2. And uh, I want to just talk about some of the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs that God fulfilled right here at the dawn of creation, all right? Because I just want you to understand this in a real human way. I don't want you to you know, kind of put your spiritual life on kind of like this pedestal and be like, look at it, it's so amazing, but you don't really experience it. It's not really brought into your life, okay? It needs to be close. It needs to be part of who you are, not just set aside something somewhere as some kind of spiritual truth to aspire to. Genesis chapter 2, we have this story about how God created man and woman, okay? And that's the point of uh, this section of scripture that I want to take you to. Um, he writes in verse 7, then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man with whom he had formed. So he is already taking care of a couple of things, shelter and food, okay? Out of the ground, the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. Oh, so now we have, you need food, you need drink. Here it is. And there it divided, but became four rivers. 
Um, skip down with me to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. In other words, even in a righteous environment where all your needs were taken care of, food, drink, and shelter, he still asks of you what? To do work. <laughs> to do a good deed. To put your hands to some use. To not only just accept what's been given to you, but actually contribute to your own need and to uh, the needs of others. Verse 16, Then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it. From the day you shall eat of it you shall surely die. And so here is a spiritual dialogue now, a spiritual conversation that's happening between the God of the creation and man. And then in verse 18, you also see the emotional side of God trying to meet the man emotionally. He said, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. Amen, men? Amen. We're not good to be alone. I don't care how brave and tough and Alaskan you think you are. It's still not good for you to be alone. Okay? So I'm going to make a man suitable, or uh, uh, somebody who's suitable for him, a helper that's suitable for him. And out of the ground, in verse 19, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought him to the man to see what he would call them, whatever the man called living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to the, all the cattle, the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field, and to Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So we can't just bury ourselves in work and call that good. It's not good. Okay? You may be doing a noble deed as taking care of animals and plants and everything else around you. You may put in your hands to good work. You still need something deeper than that. Okay? And here the Lord gives you what you need uh, at a deeper level. So in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took out of his ribs and closed up the flesh at his place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And this is an amazing thing. And right here you get just to see the emotions of the man coming out because even at first sight of a woman, he just breaks out on a full-on poetry. He's like, I'm going to write a poem. You know, it's not red as roses are red and violets are blue, but it's a poem. It, it's a love song to his wife. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And he is absolutely enthralled by her and in love with her for what God, you know, gave to him. He is so appreciative of the fact that he just, it's just satisfying him on multiple different levels. Right, guys? I mean, it satisfies on so many levels being connected with somebody that God brings into your life. It's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so here, God is taking care of physical needs. He's taking care of emotional needs. He's taking care of spiritual needs. So then we get into Genesis chapter 3, and you have this dilemma that just kind of breaks out. And in the moments just before they fall, the question erupts, what can we eat? Or what shall we eat? Now, we left Matthew chapter 5, in which God is saying, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you will drink. Here, the conversation in Genesis chapter 3 is, well, what can you really eat? You, 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 you see the questions kind of playing off on each other? Verses uh, 1 through 6, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, God has said, Thou shalt not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the tree of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you'll eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw in her own mind, thinking about earthly things, that the tree was good for food, problem number one, and that it was a delight to the eyes, oh, that's not good, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave it to her husband also. He ate, and the eyes of both of them were open, and they both knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Now, it's interesting here that in the moment before the fall, they began to ask, what can we really eat, or what shall we eat, or what should we eat? And after the fall, after they sinned, the separation that took place between them and God, they began to be consumed about what? What do we wear? Right? Like that's question number one, what do we eat? Question number two, what do we wear? Right? Chapter 3, verse 7, and both of them 
were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loin coverings. Now, before all that happened, where did they get their proper clothing? They didn't have any, but were they clothed in something? What were they clothed in? Righteousness and innocence. That was their covering, okay? And we abandoned that for something so temporary, like fig leaves, okay? And the real covering that was given to us was not uh, a fig leaf covering, but if we continued through the book of Genesis, you would see that God had to kill an animal and shed that blood to cover their sin with the leather that's produced by animal skins. And that has a real implication for our life and for our spiritual life. And so even in this moment of sin, God is not only taking care of their physical needs by providing clothing or in their emotional needs because, let's face it, if you were to walk around with fig leaves today, you wouldn't be very happy about it. And thirdly, taking care of the spiritual needs in the sense that the blood is representative of taking care of our sin forever. And it needed to be shown right there at the beginning of Genesis. Okay, now we could go further into the life of uh, Israel by uh, talking about how God took care of them in the wilderness. So go to Exodus chapter 16 with me. Exodus chapter 16, you have this people again who seemingly should be walking with the Lord. They have been taken out of the land of Egypt at this point, out of slavery. God has been doing some amazing miracles uh, he has opened up the Red Sea. They cross through on dry ground. Even though they're seeing God do these amazing things in their life, the question still becomes, what do I do about what is temporary? So verse, six, verse 1 of chapter 16, it says, Then they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after the departure from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, where we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I mean, that's, that's what we do. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't matter how close we think we're walking with the Lord. We get so focused on what is temporary. Where's the pots of meat? I haven't, gone, I haven't ate Chinese in weeks. Where's that money for that? You know? So on and so forth. That would be a terrible thing. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. I'm going to take care of your physical need. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. That I will test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. So he's testing them spiritually as well. On the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to uh, all the sons of Israel, at evening you will know that the Lord God has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? So he takes care of food by offering them manna. If you go just across the page into Exodus chapter 17, you hear a similar, similar need about what we need in this life. Our physical needs need to be taken care of. Here the people again focus on what is temporary. 17 verse 1, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed from stages from the wilderness into sin according to the command of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall we do with this people a little more, and they will stone me? And the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. Now this is, again, uh, from a tie-in to what we read at the beginning of the service in Psalms, Right? God can radically transform this piano into a pool of water if he wants to, okay? Why we doubt our God is the question. We all do it. We all struggle, right? But here you have a God of the universe who can do literally anything. Is there anything too impossible for the Lord? 
And yet we struggle and we worry. And we have all this anxiety about what is temporary. We just focus and focus and focus on what is temporary. In fact, so much so that God loves us that he takes care of even our clothing. And he did so uh, with the people wandering through the wilderness as well. If you go to Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in chapter 29, there's a testimony about that. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 29 and verse 5. He says, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness, and your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandal has not worn out on your foot. Imagine. That's how much the Lord's care is for you. That even your clothes, as you wandered around for 40 years, didn't even wear out. Now, I don't know about you, but we do have some clothes that are about 40 years old in our family. They're like riddled with holes. You ever seen these things? That's like putting on a piece of confetti, and you're like, yeah, it still fits. It wasn't so here. I mean, everything was perfect. The sandals didn't wear out. How many pairs of Nikes have we thrown out, guys, because the sole was wore out? They, they would never... Imagine never wearing out. It's an amazing, an amazing thing. And God does all of this stuff to remind you how much he cares for you. And if you were to look at Exodus chapter 12, verses 33 through 36, you would even realize that because of the great work that God was doing in their lives, they were able to plunder the Egyptians as they were coming out. They took mounds and mounds of clothes with them, and God preserved all of those things. So we get into Matthew chapter uh, 6, and we want to read a section of Scripture here again, verses 25 through 34. And it says this, Matthew 6, 25 through 34, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, you've got to put yourself in the context of this nation of Israel. This is their story this is their history. You know, Christ is speaking to the religious first. In the same way he giving you a sermon to the religious first for you to grow. Now, you've got to graft your in, yourself into their history, but this really was their history. Christ is putting their back against the wall and saying, do not be worried about your life. Be reminded of what I did in your past. I'm still going to take care of you in the future. Verse 26, look at the birds of the sky. They do not sow, nor do they reap, nor gather crops in the barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? Sometimes that's the question. You bring the value of you down there. God does not bring the value of you down there. Okay? Uh, pick all the animals of the world. The sparrow is probably the most annoying, right, farmers? The big nuisance. They turd on everything. He is concerned about every sparrow that falls on the ground. How much more valuable are you than them? Granted, we do the same thing as the sparrow. We turd on everything as well. So maybe that's a bad example. Or a good example. And each one of you being worried can add a single day to his lifespan. Verse 28. And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not Labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? And here's the biggest problem. You of little faith. You of little faith. That's the problem. And the sooner we're honest about that, the better. Here is Christ talking to the religious people and saying, you of little faith. I, I, I can do anything. I can do anything. Just ask of me. You matter to me that much. But here's the other bone. In regards to not having the faith, we become a lot like the Gentiles in verse 32. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? That's what we consume our life with. What am, what, am I going to, what am I going to do in my life? Am I going to seek all of the earthly possessions? Am I going to seek trying to 
wear, you know, clothing that's going to make me feel, you know, a certain way, you know, am I going to put food in my belly that, you know, steak and lobster, whatever the case may be, am I consumed by that kind of a lifestyle, or am I consumed by just being a member of the kingdom of God, which is where he goes in verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom and all his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. They just, they just come out of nowhere sometimes. And I could give you testimony after testimony, and my wife, my life with my wife, that would validate that over and over again, and as I'm sure that you could as well. Now, it's not just that Christ leaves it here in the Sermon on the Mount and he never focuses on it again. It's not like, okay, God, that was great. Moving on. No, when he, when he commands his first disciples that were walking with him, he, he now makes them walk the walk and talk the talk. He makes them do what he preached in Psalms chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 6. So go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse and 5 through 13 and look at the example that's provided. It's not that this was just some high dialogue, some just high spiritual conversation, but when these people were going out to do ministry, this was the way that they were supposed to do it. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5 says, The twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go on the road to the Gentiles. It wasn't their time yet to be brought into the kingdom. That's a whole other conversation. And do not enter a city of Samaritans for the same reason, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, God is always going to go to the house of Israel first. Verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. And that should be the heart of all of our lives. Everything that I have in my wallet was given to me by the God of the universe. Freely it was given, freely it goes back out. Whatever that means that God has given to us. Um... Verse 9, do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts. Don't, don't store this stuff up. If God has freely given to you, give it out as fast as you possibly can. Verse 10, or a bag for your journey, or even two tunics or sandals or a staff for the workers deserving of his support. In other words, you're doing a good work. Trust the Lord that he's going to provide for your needs. Don't, don't do this for money. Don't be concerned about food. Don't be concerned about clothing. A worker is deserving of a support. Verse 11, in whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay at his house until you leave that city because God's going to provide you shelter. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. Verse 13, if the house is worthy, see that your blessing of peace, blessing of peace comes on it. So here you you're on a spiritual work. You're dwelling with the Lord in real faith, being totally reliant on him for your every need. The next thing becomes you walk into somebody's house and you give it, give it the peace. Give it your peace. You bless the house with peace. You can't begin to give a house peace if you haven't done these other chunks yet. You cannot give what you, have, what you do not have. Does that make sense? If you're, if you're so lost that you're not in a right relationship with the Lord, if you're so lost you're not walking in faith, don't walk into somebody's house and be like, peace be on this place. You don't know what peace is yet. But if it's not worthy... Take back your blessing of peace. It just means, family, there will be some people who just don't understand this kind of faith living out. They will just get out of here, punk. In verse 14, and whoever does not receive you nor listen to your words as you leave the house of city, just shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it is more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. And with that... We'll close. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today and for your word. Lord, as we continue to dive in this from week to week, um, there's a lot that needs to be said here, Lord. We just pray that you'd give us patience to see every point, that you'd give us the willingness to um, 
to abide by your commands. We just pray that you'd find us faithful to see your commands and walk into them. Lord, we just pray that you'd see our lives full of faith. Lord, we just pray that you would add your favor to us as we start out, even in the smallest of ways, Lord. We may be mealier than our brother or sister right now. We may be mealier, of course, than the Apostle Paul or Christ himself, Lord. But as we take the first steps, Lord, we just pray for your favor and for your joy to fill our lives as we choose to make it more and more about you in this life. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.